Joining me now, Defence Industry Minister Pat Conroy. Thanks very much for your time. Just first of all, on the, the cost of these and how we're paying for them, is this already allocated money or will you need to find this in the budget in May? Uh, so the, the Tomahawk acquisition is part of the Defence Integrated Investment Program. So money has been put aside. Defen uh, government hasn't made what's called the second pass approval. It's gone through the approval processes to this stage and that's where we get the pricing information from uh, the US system and then uh, government will make a final decision. But the, the money is allocated within the IIP for what is around a $1.3 billion expenditure. This is associated with equipping the Hobart class air warfare destroyers with long range strike to really give them uh, a greater firepower and great ability to keep potential adversaries at bay, which is obviously uh, a, a continuing theme of the Albanese Labor government's uh, uh, defence initiatives, which is all about improving long range strike uh, for the Australian Defence Force. And what about on our submarines? Will they go on the Virginia class submarines? Well, the, the United States Virginia class submarine have that capability. The Virginia class submarines that we will be acquiring in the early 2030s will have vertical launch tubes, which is the system that they're launched out of. So uh, we don't want to get ahead of ourselves, but obviously we've been very clear that any future nuclear submarine, a powered submarine that we acquire, whether it's the Virginias or SSN AUKUS, will have the capacity for torpedoes, will have the co capacity for uh, cruise missiles such as Tomahawk, and hopefully, as the technology develops, the ability to fire hypersonic missiles. So long-range strike is at the heart of this government's commitment to uh, uh, equipping the Australian Defence Force. Our national security and our defence rests on keeping adversary at bay as far as way as possible. OK, so when, you're, when you say you don't want to get ahead of yourself, what do you mean by that, that it might not be... The Tomahawk, but it would be a similar missile if it weren't that on the submarine. Is that is that what you're saying? Well, we're, we're envisaging a Tomahawk, but we haven't made a formal decision on that yet. Uh, and so I'm, I'm just trying to be frank with your listeners, or your viewers rather, but the Virginia class that's in service for the United States has Tomahawk cruise missiles in its vertical launch tubes. We've been very clear that the capability we're acquiring will have the capacity to launch cruise missiles, so the Tomahawk is the logical platform, but that's not part of what uh, we've gone to the United States government with. The, the potential acquisition of up to 200 120 Tomahawk cruise missiles is to okay. equip the uh, Hobart class air warfare destroyers. Japan two weeks ago confirmed it wanted to buy 400 Tomahawks from the US. What does all this say about the, the build up in the region? Well, we've been very open with the Australian public that we're facing the, the, the most significant regional arms race since World War II, and that's at the same time as we face the greatest strategic uncertainty since 1945. So it's been incumbent on our government to invest and improve uh, our defence capability. This is really important because this is about deter deterring any potential adversaries to promote peace and stability, and that's why we've made the AUKUS announcement about the acquisition of nuclear power submarines and that's why uh, uh, equipping our naval vessels with uh, long-range strike is critical to in improving the capability of the ADF. I was taking a look at countries with nuclear submarines the other day, nuclear propelled submarines. I'm pretty sure every one of those countries also had nuclear weapons. Would that be a possible step for Australia one day? Absolutely not. We've been very clear that we will not be acquiring nuclear weapons. Uh, we are a signatory to the uh, Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty. We're a proud signatory to the Treaty of Rarotonga, which commits to a nuclear weapons-free South Pacific. We will not be acquiring nuclear weapons. OK. That, that's, that's clear. And importantly, like clear and importantly, as part yeah. of the Aquas... OK. Sorry, no, I'm saying that's clear. Fair I enough. Was just saying, as no as part of... There. Yeah. Come on, finish your thought. I was just going to say, as part of uh, the acquisition of the Virginia class and SSN AUKUS is the fact that we are acquiring 
a reactor that is sealed and completely welded shut. We do not have to touch the reactor and that's critical because we do not have a significant domestic nuclear industry other than Lucas Heights and a bit of medical research mm. and we don't want to pursue that. And that's why uh, acquiring a reactor through this process is so critical. We do not have to refuel it. We do not have to touch it for the roughly okay. three decade life of our submarines. What about the prospect that as part of the deterrent, even if we don't have our own nuclear weapons, we might need to host them in some form via, say, the US. Is that on the table? Uh, that is not on the table. We, we obviously uh, are, uh, are allies of the United States and we have the Treaty of ANZUS that uh, it gives us protection and obligations and uh, we, we exist under the, the nuclear umbrella, as some say, but uh, we are committed to uh, the, the Treaty of Rarotonga, which commits us to a, a nuclear weapons-free South Pacific. And just finally, on the cost, when we get back to the submarines, 0.15% of GDP is how the cost was described. That's an average over the whole life of the project. It obviously starts very low. How high does it get? What's the highest projected annual cost? Well, I've, I'm not in position to reveal that figure. We've been very clear that the 0.15% measure is the most accurate. It's the most accurate because it demonstrates the scale of national effort, that this is uh, required for this. It's still uh, uh, in the order of one-tenth to uh, of our... Uh, well, it's actually less than one-tenth of our defence budget, uh, but it's a, it's a considerable effort that we've been very clear. And importantly, those costs include things like the cost of sustaining the submarines, the workforce associated with it, the cost of the weapons, the cost of okay. the infrastructure. Uh, uh, and that's important because unlike the attack class, for example, that didn't have any of those costs. So the $90 billion figure that the last government quoted for the attack class underestimated dramatically the cost right. Right. So sure, we're being very sure. that's transparent you're saying. to the Australian public. Yeah. But, okay, but, well, but how yeah. about being this transparent, though? Because but, you say it's the most accurate cost. Sure, that's the average. But another way to measure it is how much impost it will put on any one budget. Do, do you have that figure? Has the government calculated the figure? How much this will cost in its most expensive well, year? Well, we've been very clear about the costs over the next four years, which is $9 billion, and over the decade, which is 50 to $58 billion. Uh, we think once you go beyond there, GDP is a much better measure because you've got variations like, for example, the exchange rate drives a big chunk of these costs, given parts for this uh, submarine will come from the United States or the United Kingdom. So I know it's a frustrating answer, but it actually is the most accurate answer, is to use the measurement of 0.15% of right. GDP. But has anyone done that? across figure? the life of the program. There, there must also be a calculation on how oh, it spikes. We're, we're, we've got a good idea of the cost figures and obviously you've got more accuracy uh, earlier in the process and we understand that. But a lot of this is to be still figured out, uh, to be honest, because uh, the, the full design of SSN Orcus is not complete. The build strategy has not been finalised. So that's right. why we're using the GDP figure because it's a more accurate measure. And we're very confident, for example, that, gives, that includes a very significant amount of contingency in it uh, to deal with uh, the challenges that will come in this really exciting okay. nation building project. Pat Conroy, got to leave it there. Thank you. Thanks, Tom.